Thank you. Can you come and um, hit record? Thank you, love. Sorry, please don't kick the ball, love. <sighs> Hello, and welcome to a most unusual edition of The Sky at Night. This is the 800th episode since the programme began back in 1957, and as ever, we'll be celebrating the exploration of the universe, even in the strangest of times. This episode, as I'm sure you'll see, is being filmed under lockdown. So I'm out here in my garden, Chris is at home, and when it gets dark, I'm sure Pete will be in his garden. And rather than the usual crew, I've got this small camera and some help from my daughter. Astronomers looking at the sky from back gardens and through computer screens are keeping busy. While many telescopes have been forced to close down, some, thanks to their sophisticated robotics and remote control, are able to continue scanning the skies. And if you fancy contributing to our understanding of the solar system, we'll show you how. We'll have a special treat from the archives. Welcome to the sky at night. That's my light. Observatories around the world have been forced to close down during the COVID-19 pandemic. Even in remote spots like Mauna Kea in Hawaii, most of our great telescopes have had to close their doors. But not all. Some, like this, the Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System, or ATLAS for short, is managing to continue operations, monitored remotely from a bedroom in Belfast. This is when you start recording. I spoke with two members of the Atlas team, Alan Fitzsimmons and Jamie Robinson, to hear about the Atlas project and how they managed to keep it going during the lockdown. Can I change the shot? Uh, no, leave it for a sec. Well, welcome. It's great to talk to you in the, these weird circumstances. Um, how is the lockdown going for you guys? Alan, how, how are you coping? Well, to be honest, uh, I'm not doing too bad. Thanks for asking. I think it is a strange time for all of us in the country at the moment. One of the nice things, of course, about uh, astronomy is that uh, with today's technology and so on, you're not preventing, or prevented, I should say, from doing too much work. So what observing are you managing to get done? Are you still managing to get data? Yes, we are. And as you say, we're part of the Atlas project, a set of two half metre telescopes in Hawaii that robotically every night scan the sky looking for these asteroids and comets, in particular new ones. Which is partly to find out if they're going to hit the Earth, of course. It's designed to give us, hopefully, some warning of objects that we may not have seen before, but are on their last approach, i.e. they're going to come and hit us, or at least pass fairly close in the next few days. Well, it's kind of reassuring that our alert system's still there. Jamie, maybe you could tell us how Atlas goes about uh, finding near-Earth asteroids, or potentially dangerous asteroids. This is sort of the dashboard. It's an overview of everything that's going on right now in Haleakala. So we've got where the telescope has been pointing today and then some sort of views of the sky and weather and some status stuff. Uh, what is the weather like in Hawaii today? Oh, not, not great, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Here you can see uh, the sky looks a little clearer at Mauna Loa on the big island of Hawaii. And indeed, right now, Atlas, uh, the Atlas unit on Mauna Loa is scanning a very southern sky. You can see all of that large area of sky that Atlas has been surveying so and taking the, images. The, the grey squares, right? That you can see. It's I mean, to me, that's amazing. If that's the whole sky. That, that's right. And with two telescopes, Atlas in clear weather can cover half the visible sky seen from Hawaii every night. And that's crucial when you're looking for these faint and, and, and early detection of things. Absolutely. The, again, if we detect something on an impact trajectory, we want to, uh, to know about it as soon as possible. And right now, we, we can get uh, a few days warning. 
these telescopes take pictures of the sky every night. They're, this is where them being robotic really helps. They can just go da, 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 all the way across the sky. And over the course of their observations, they've built up a really good map of things in the background. So stuff like stars, uh, galaxies, what they do is they subtract that background. And then what we're left behind with, any little points of light, those will be objects that are either moving across the sky, such as asteroids or comets. So if I pull up this web page here and click show me the asteroids. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a straightforward instruction. That's lovely. Yeah. And uh, this is then what I'm presented with. This one here. OK, this... so this is one object, all the data that we've got for one object. Yep. So these are the four images that have been put together into a tracklet. So this object here, it's moving relatively fast across the sky at 3.26 degrees per day. It's amazing to think that you're showing us data that you've seen and, and no one else has. And then over the next few days and weeks, we see more observations being added to it by yeah, the professional amateur uh, community. And then once we know exactly what orbit it's on, then that's when it can get its designation through the Minor Planet Center. So there is a NASA web page uh, called Scout. Uh, their processing software is what allows them to make a very good estimate on how hazardous this object is. Uh, and when we go onto this object, we're given a summary number of observations. Initially, it only had the four observations, but there's three additional ones that have been done since two days ago, which is great. Its impact rating is zero. You'll be glad to know. Good. OK, uh, <laughs> so we're not announcing on Sky at Night that you found, found an impact. <laughs> People have been talking about Atlas recently because of a, a comet that it discovers. Can you can you tell us a bit about Comet Atlas? Yeah, we do pick up many comets uh, each year with Atlas, both known ones and also a few new objects. And, and in fact, uh, uh, two days ago, uh, Jamie discovered two new comets. Excellent and, and amazing to find a comet from your own house, Jamie. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a... Uh... It's a bit mind-boggling whenever you stop and think about it. So, Alan, if people have heard of Atlas, it's because of Comet Atlas Y4. Why were people so interested in this particular comet? Well, of course, when it was first discovered by Atlas, like all other comets that we find, we didn't know where it was going. It's just a, a moving fuzzball against the background stars. But uh, after a couple of weeks, it, it became apparent that this was coming in and going to get quite close to the sun. And because of that, it was suspected that this could get quite bright and it was quite exciting. However, unfortunately, with this comet, uh, earlier this month, it was spotted breaking up. It seemed to split up into at least four pieces. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope released a, an image just uh, the other day showing uh, multiple fragments there. And the probability of a very bright comet being in the sky next month in May uh, is receding. However, the, the main fragment does seem to be holding itself together. So who knows? We have to keep our fingers crossed. All right. Well, look, I should let you all get back to it. Um, Jamie, who, who's on shift this week? That would be me. OK, well, I really should let you go. But thank you. Thank <laughs> yeah. you for, for your time. If you do spot something uh, that's on its way in, um, do give us a call back. Bye. While we're stuck at home, the robotic probes that we've sent out into the solar system are still exploring. ESA's Bepi Colombo flew past Earth just last month. But first, news from Mars. Last April we met with members of the Mars Insight team. Okay, so this is data from Mars. Every day when we get new data from Mars, I'm like, this is data from Mars. Anna Holliston sent us this video message giving us the latest news on their studies of Mars quakes and how the team are coping with running a rover on another planet during lockdown. So as I sit here at home recording this for you, InSight has just entered its 500th day on Mars, or its 500th sol as we say. That's 500 days of remote working and self-isolation, which is a pretty, um, pretty impressive feat, I'd say. <laughs> 
Now, it's not only 500 days of remote working, it's also 500 days of data. And some of that data has been really exciting. We've not only seen Mars quakes, but we've seen Mars quakes that we can locate. Locating a Mars quake is a tricky business. And two of them we've located to an area called Cerberus Fossae. Now, Cerberus Fossae is a network of trenches that run for over a thousand kilometers across the surface of Mars. And we'd hoped that we might see quakes from here, but it's really, really exciting that we actually have. In other news on the mission, the mole, which is attempting to drill its way five meters down, has gone down and up and down and up and down and up, but is now going down again as we apply just a little bit of pressure with the scoop from the robotic arm, just on the top of the mole, so that as it hammers, it can't bounce back out again. And that seems to be working. And it's a real testament to the international collaborative effort that has kept our data flowing. It's not just InSight still working on Mars, it's the satellites orbiting Mars that are still communicating and the deep space network that receives those transmissions, the network of telescopes all around the world. And despite the different lockdowns in all those places, we're still getting our data. And hopefully, before too long, we'll get to meet face to face and we'll have more results to discuss. Stay well, everybody. In November 2018, we were excited to cover the launch of ESA's BepiColombo probe, sending it off on an incredible journey to our solar system's innermost planet, Mercury. Its journey involves one Earth flyby, two trips to Venus, and six close passes of Mercury itself before it settles into orbit in 2026. Just a few weeks ago, BepiColombo successfully swung past the Earth, and thanks to an assist from our planet's gravity, is now on the correct curved path towards the inner solar system. The probe came within 8,000 miles of the Earth's surface, and it took an amazing selfie as it passed by. Now, it's looping its way to its next date with a planet, Venus, in October. There's a great story about this Bepi flyby. It was spotted by a bunch of amateur asteroid hunters in Northolt in North London, who reported it to the Minor Planet Center, saying that it was artificial. But something got lost in translation, and it was briefly given an official asteroid number known as 2020 GL2. And in fact, the algorithms that astronomers use calculated that on its orbit, there was a one in 400,000 chance that it would collide with Earth sometime in the next decade. Luckily, it was soon recognized as artificial, but it goes to show just how sensitive our searches for near-Earth asteroids have become, if we can spot a tiny spacecraft that whizzes past the Earth. As promised earlier, here's Pete in his garden, on his own, in search of meteors. It was a beautiful day. The sky is crystal clear, lovely and blue up there. Great prelude to, hopefully, what's gonna come about tonight. And we're at the peak of the Lyrid meteor shower. So hopefully I'll get to see some of the meteor trails. It's not the most active of showers, but it does mark the start of meteor spotting season. Now my secret weapon will be this, which I'm gonna fit with a hammock. And then I intend to lie out here throughout the whole evening looking for Lyrid meteors. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, hopefully this is recording, because the last one didn't. I don't know if you can see me properly there. As the sun has gone down now, up high over there, there is a really bright dot in the sky, and that's the planet Venus. And I've set my big telescope up to have a look at it. The telescope is set up and pointing at Venus. It's got a camera on the end of it. There's the camera. And I don't know whether you can actually see Venus itself, but it's pretty, prominent as the sky starts to get darker um, but it's a very beautiful planet at the moment if i'm the sun and this is venus and you're earth venus is heading around towards earth so through the eyepiece of a telescope it looks like it's getting bigger and its phase is decreasing and at the moment it's got a beautiful crescent phase and it's quite glorious have a look it's on my laptop screen and that's incredible that's just a little dot up in the sky. Now Venus is a good example of something which you can look for even if you haven't got perfect skies because 
it's so bright. Venus shines out, it shines through the light pollution and you can pick it out really easily. It's high up in the sky towards the northwest after the sun has gone down at the moment, but it's not gonna be there forever. And as we go through May, Venus is starting to move into that position where it lines up with the sun. That's called inferior conjunction. It's between the Earth and the sun. I tell you what, you're not gonna miss it when it's gone. The hammock's going to go like so, in theory, as long as I don't fall out, and hopefully see some meteors. Okay, well, it's a gloriously dark night, perfectly clear for observing a meteor shower. There we go. I've already seen one earlier tonight. It was a bright fireball that fragmented as it came down. You know, there's something quite magical about laying out under the stars. They're old friends to me. I've known them for many, many years, and I find great comfort in them. It's very peaceful out here. I normally have a, a crew working with me, somebody operating the camera, somebody operating the lights and the sound, um, but there's just me this time. There are no, very few aircraft flying over the sky, for one thing, I've noticed that. Right above me, I've got the seven stars of the plow, we'll take the handle, of the saucepan, arc it round and it follows round to Arcturus, the orange red giant star in Boertes the Herdsman, carry the line round and it comes down to the brilliant white spiker in Virgo. And it's just beautiful looking at that spring sky. It's quite a lot to look forward to as well. We've got the planets, we've got Jupiter and Saturn close together at the moment, and they will come together um, so that in December they'll be really, really close. And that's the closest they've been since 1623. That's an event called a Great Conjunction. And then of course we'll have Mars. Mars is coming to opposition this year, and uh, the latter part of the year, and that should be fantastic as well. Yeah, plenty to look forward to and keep hopeful about. I've got my camera clicking away as well, so if, if I get too comfortable and I fall asleep, as has been known, then at least the camera will pick up anything that's going on. Good morning. So after a long night outside looking for meteors, I've now got to go and pick up my camera and then see if I've got any meteor trails. into the computer. You go through potentially thousands of images. Oh, that's, that's a satellite or an aircraft. Probably an aircraft's quite bright. So you're sort of flicking through one after the other in the hope that you're going to see something. Oh, yeah, that was one. That was quite a nice one, actually. Let's play that back. See if I can pause, there we go. Look at that. Yeah, so Vega would be over here. Yeah, that's a Lyrid. Wow. So I'll put that down as a success. And here are some of the pictures that you managed to get of this year's Lyrid meteors. Other than Earth, there is only one planet that we have photographed in extraordinary detail, Mars. Thanks to the many satellites and rovers we've sent there over the past 50 years, every corner of the planet has been imaged. And what we're presented with is breathtaking scenery, the likes of which are not seen anywhere on Earth. Vast plains riddled with hundreds of thousands of craters. Deep, snaking canyons, likely carved from flowing rivers of the past and record-breaking volcanoes up to a hundred times larger than any on Earth, including Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in our solar system. These images allow us to study the surface features of Mars in intimate geological detail. But modern-day astronomical projects create astronomical amounts of data. And even with vast arrays of high-powered computers, 
it can take years to sift through that data to find the nuggets. Sometimes computers just don't cut the mustard. What we really need is a vast array of good old fashioned human brains. One such project is Planet 4, part of the Zooniverse platform of citizen science projects. Planet 4 is a project dedicated to examining the unique surface features of Mars, and it's something that everyone can get involved with. I caught up with project scientist Meg Schwamm, who, like the rest of us, is in lockdown. Oh, I think that's Meg calling. Hello. Hello. Lovely to see you. <laughs> Likewise. So Planet 4 sounds fascinating. Can you tell me a bit more about it? What are your goals? What are your aims? Planet 4 is actually an online citizen science project, and it's on the Zooniverse platform. So um, there's projects enlisting the public to help um, mine large data sets and do things that computers can't do. Um, so we're trying to really understand more about Mars and its history and its climate and how it changes over time. The project uses images taken by the high-res camera on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that has been circling Mars for nearly 14 years. And the pictures it's taken show the surface in astonishing detail. So it's giving you really good data, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it is the most powerful camera we've sent to another planet. And it can see about a coffee table sized object on Mars. So you actually can see boulders in the images. The Martian features that most interest Meg are seen in pictures taken at the South Polar region of Mars vast areas covered in patterns of dark vans, streaks and blotches. So this is an example of a high resolution image from the high rise camera. And so what we're seeing here is these beautiful dark sort of fans or streaks. So yeah, so there's hundreds and thousands of these fans because we have such high resolution data. The dark vans pepper the great ice cap that covers the South Pole every winter. But it's an ice cap made not of water ice, but carbon dioxide ice. And it's a particular property of this dry ice that results in these uniquely Martian features. It's a completely alien process, which I find really exciting. A lot of times we want to talk about how Earth-like Mars is, but this is a completely Mars feature we don't see on Earth. It's all to do with what happens when the ice is warmed in spring. Our water ice here on Earth goes from ice to liquid water and then eventually to water vapour as it warms. Carbon dioxide ice skips the liquid stage. It goes straight from solid ice to gas, a process called sublimation. This is an artist rendition of what we think is going on on the South Pole of Mars in the spring when the sun um, appears. And so when the sun reappears in southern spring, the ice uh, starts to sublimate where it's in contact with the warm ground. The light actually passes through the ice sheet, and so you start getting some warming. And so now you've got a layer of trapped gas next to the dirt that is trying to find its way up through an ice sheet. And so what is it going to do? It's going to break out in these dramatic sort of jets. So I guess anywhere there's a crack or a fissure, all the gas comes rushing out at once. That's what we think. And so these jets, while well, they're bringing up all that carbon dioxide gas and it's whooshing out from that crack, it's bringing up um, dust and dirt from the, oh. the dirt below. And, and I suppose it, it's quite a powerful jet. It's quite a force coming through. So it just grabs stuff and brings it to the surface um, as it does it. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be standing on the South Pole during <laughs> I bet it's pretty loud and cracking and ice cracking. And yeah, uh, and then if there's wind, the winds are blowing them into these dark streaks that we see on the surface. And where we don't really see a streak, we sort of see more like a blob or a lips type of feature. We think there just wasn't enough wind to blow the material. And so if we can mark the shapes, directions, and sizes of these fans, we're really understanding um, and learning about the Martian climate because every one of these fans is a wind sock. And it's telling us which way the wind was blowing and at that time when the vent was going off. Um, and so the idea being is if we can map all of these, we produce the largest wind map on the surface of Mars and really try to understand the climate. So what do you want people who join Planet 4 to do? So we're asking them their help to map these features, to actually draw and mark where these seasonal fans are. 
And it's really hard for computers to do, but your eye is really able to easily see where these things are outlined. And how's the take-up been so far? It's been fantastic. So far, looking on the website, we see that people from uh, Europe and South America and Africa and Egypt and all around the world have been participating, which I'm really excited about. So if you're bored while in lockdown and need something to do, or you just need to escape from this world to another, um, just go to planet4.space. We're stuck in our homes, but you can actually rove the surface of Mars. It seems like the ultimate lockdown project. Absolutely. From your own sofa, you can go explore another world. But wouldn't you be publishing the results later? We're working on several papers. So we figure that probably in the next couple of years, combining all this data we're getting from the new site, we'll be able to publish this in the paper. So I'd love to be able to come back and tell you about those results when we have them. It's okay, thank you. I signed up to Meg's Planet 4 project and had a go with my daughter. We both found it strangely captivating. I guess, are these fans or blotches? Blotches. Blotches, and lots of them. Oops. It's quite extraordinary to be sitting at home, marking features on the surface of another world and knowing we are contributing to our understanding of our neighbouring planet. The Sky at Night's 800 episodes stretch back over 62 years, back to the dawn of the space age. And over that time, the programme has taken many different forms. I wonder what Patrick would have made of this one. Sadly, some of our earlier shows have fallen into a black hole. But here's a treat from the past 799 episodes the newly commissioned arrangement of our beloved theme tune. The Earth is quite beautiful from space. It's very blue and quite remote. You're one of the very, very few people, I think, whose opinion on this is really worth having. What's it like to walk on Mars? Very comfortable, actually. Okay, so I can see a star there. There's the diamond ring, an incredible sight. This is one of the most dramatic places in the world. I hope you anything new to add, not in principle. Welcome to Sky at Night, Chris. Thank you. Literally holes in space that stuff can fall in. I've never uh, watched the skies in the company of so many people. There's no doubt at all of it. Most of the time. Will the universe end? Well, the truth is, we don't know. You are worrying me. <laughs> Still feel the tension in the air. God willing, it we still return. Stay safe and and keep looking up. Good night.